Hello and welcome to Into the Light. I'm Pastor Dennis Cummins. I'm the lead pastor here at Experience Church. We so are appreciative that you're here with us and uh, trusting that we're empowering you with information so that you will know how to address the current issues that are going on uh, today. Uh, today, we have Mark Melosha with the Family Policy Institute. He's back with us today. Mark, so good to have you. Good to be here I again. appreciate being able to do these with you. And our new guest, Dr. Christian Overman. For 14 years, Christian Overman has served as the principal of a Christian school in Seattle, Washington. In 2000, he founded an educational consulting service, uh, which uh, it was called Worldview Matters. He taught Christian educators throughout the United States, Central and South America, Europe, and uh, Africa, Asia, and how to develop lesson plans with all subjects that are seen in a larger context of a biblical worldview. And there's a concept that you don't hear much of today. Uh, he holds master's degree uh, from in education from Seattle Pacific University with an emphasis on philosophy of Christian education and a doctorate of ministry degree with an emphasis on theology of work. And so, Dr. Overman, you're also an author, and you are a blessing to have on with us today. Welcome. I'm, I'm blessed to be here. Thank you. Well, Mark, uh, why don't we just kind of kick this off? I know we're going to talk about critical race theory, uh, social justice. I know there's so many labels that uh, the school system and teachers are using now that, you know, they're saying, well, we're not teaching crit critical race theory but they are through other means and what have you. So uh, let's just kind of kick this off, punt the ball, and we'll, we'll get started. Well, um, for those folks who are paying attention, uh, the last four or six years, there's been kind of a revolution going on in America. A new ideology has been taking over. It's a Marxist in origin, neo-pagan. Um, it's actually the opposite of anything that it would one consider, consider biblical or Christian. Mm -hmm. And it is taking over a lot of the major institutions, political leaders in our country. They've thrown out basically, you know, our constitution, our American history, and the principles this country was founded on. And they've completely and utterly rejected this Judeo-Christian worldview that formed America and formed our nation to really until, frankly, President Obama announced one time, to me almost seemed like a little bit of glee that we're no longer a Christian nation. Right. And so that's where we are now. And now we're starting to see the radical implementation into government, into law, into all the institutions um, of this new ideology. And critical race theory is one of these legs, one of, one of these ideologies that's being put in law that is gonna utterly transform, maybe I should use the word decimate, our country. Yeah, yeah, come against the nuclear family and, and decimate the biblical Christian values. Uh, Dr. Overman, you, 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 you've got a ministry degree in uh, theology, uh, but I, I like the fact how you are designing or have designed lesson plans with a biblical worldview. Um, help us understand why that's important, especially when it's addressing critical race theory and social justice, whatever label that is. Yeah, yeah. Well, we help teachers to know how they can teach any subject at any grade level in a way that puts that subject matter into the context Mm -hmm. of a biblical view of reality. Now, it's all about contextualization. We yeah. don't give them the lesson plans. They figure that out. But we sure. say, well, here's some tools that will help you. You're teaching a unit on photosynthesis in your fourth grade plant studies. Mm -hmm. Okay. How can those kids see photosynthesis from the perspective that there's a God who created it, he had a reason for creating it, that there is a purpose for it for humanity. How do we fit into that purpose? And how do we see it in terms of a biblically shaped moral context? Mm -hmm. And there is one for plants. And uh, what is the purpose of all of this? And so if you help your teachers to see how they can help their students to see photosynthesis in the context of that bigger picture or through that lens, right. then you're helping them to think 
think Christianly or biblically about plants. And that same process can be done for any subject at any grade level, you know, from pre-K to 12. This is the problem, by the way, with the critical race theory. Is, 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 as you know, Mark, they're saying now, hey, we don't teach critical race theory. Well, it's a half-truth. In fact, yeah. it's not even a half-truth. They do not teach kindergartners critical race theory, you know, 101 at all. Right. But what they do is they take the precepts and the principles and the concepts and the dogmas and the suppositions of critical race theory. They translate that into the classroom by reading books like uh, Heather Has Two Mommies. Okay, that, by the way, that book came out in 1989. Yep. That's over 30 years ago. Okay, all you need to do is read a few books. And then, by the way, that book was intended for pre-K and K students. Okay, now, if you read that book, what you're doing is you're normalizing homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And you're normalizing your so-called same-sex marriage. Right. You don't have to say to your kids, hey, there's a problem here. These Christians have said this is wrong, but we know it's right. You don't have to say that at all. All you need to do is normalize it and say, let's hear a story here. Yeah. So the what I would call authentic Christian education is where you help your students to see the normalization of truth mm-hmm. in the context of academics. And it's a lost art. It used to be done regularly. And if you press down, you'll find out that it goes back to the Puritan circle of knowledge, which is another thing that I don't want to get into the weeds here, but it's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. But we've lost it since um, the 20th century and um, the separation of schooling from the church. By the way, almost every collegiate institution prior to the Revolutionary War, except for the University of Pennsylvania, I think it was, uh, was started by some branch of the church, including mm-hmm. Harvard and Rutgers and all these, you know. Uh, it was, they came out of the church. And then we abdicated, okay? Yeah. In the yeah. latter half of the 19th century, and so we abdicated, let's let the public schools do this. And the rest is history, and we're paying the fruit of it right now. Absolutely. And it's a long time coming, but this is where we're at, because we have uh, bifurcated mm-hmm. uh, education from the role of the church. Well, you you talk about a Christian worldview in, in everything that we teach and and bring to children in light, you know. And I like to say, um, Genesis confusion, Genesis chapter one confusion leads to doctrine delusions. Hmm. And yeah. without instilling the the foundational truth of creation and who God is, yep. we lose everything and what our purpose is. Too. Absolutely, and that purpose is also in Genesis one. Yes, where God said, let us make man in our likeness and image, and let them steward and govern over this thing we've created here. Yes. And he gave us a commission. I call it the first commission. Mm-hmm. Okay, And I'm not trying to minimize the great commission oh, in no. Matthew. Okay, We still need to help people understand that Jesus is Lord and, and that they can be saved mm-hmm. from their sins. But the first commission came before the fall, the yeah. fall just makes it more difficult. But we are here, I believe, we are here to govern well over this material world. That's right. I'll tell you one quick story, and I don't mean to minim- you know, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much here, but uh, I, w- I was teaching a group of um, principals and teachers at a conference, Christian school conference, not too far from here. And I didn't intend to do this, but just spontaneously, this thought came to me. And I said to this group, about 25 or 30 educators, I said, what is the purpose of education? And I paused just very briefly, because I didn't want someone else to give an off-the-wall answer, (laughs) and and I I answered answered my own question. (laughs) I said, I said this, I said, the purpose of education is to equip the next generation to rule well over this material world. Mm -hmm. And you could have heard a pin drop. It was like, you know, the air went out of the room, it was just total silence. Teacher up near the front, she broke the silence and she said, would you mind repeating that? And I said, the purpose of education is to equip the next generation to rule well over this material world. And I said, has anyone ever told you that before? Not a single hand went up. Not a single one. They never heard that before. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that shows you that we have a shift to make in our view of education and our view of learning, that we have a responsibility here to govern well over this material world for now, yeah. okay? And that involves getting involved in every sphere and aspect of reality, mm-hmm. from the family uh, to education, but also to um, issues, policy, 
public policy included politics. Uh, politics is, is, is mainly the codification of morality uh, exactly. on a practical level. And so, you know, why shouldn't we involve in the codification of morality if we love our neighbors? Yeah. If we care for them, okay, we ought to have a voice in that. And uh, so the purpose of education is to equip us to rule well and to actually take the raw materials of the planet and to reshape it into secondary creations like these TV cameras and, yeah. and the computer and everything else. So this is what we've lost. We've lost the purpose of learning, and that's why we're in a mess we've got right now. And uh, so we're trying to fix that, and that's why Mark's here. Yes. To tell us how to fix it. <laughs> He's been bending my ear for the last 20 minutes in the car. <laughs> With how do we fix it? How do we fix it? How do we fix it? And I guess I go back to the basics, to the Great Commission, um, which is guiding our organization. And it should guide every faithful Christian, every believer in our state. Um, we're here to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them, bring them back to God, to save their souls. But more importantly is, is the next part. Teach them to obey everything that I commanded. Yeah. So that brings you back to what is this morality? How are we supposed mm -hmm. to live? What are we supposed to put in law? What is good? What is evil? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the purpose of education. That is the purpose of government. So we have a direct commission from God to be involved. So when somebody says separation of church and state, I shouldn't be involved, Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. Well, who should decide the morality of a nation? Yeah. What are we are supposed to obey or what are we supposed to promote? If Christians aren't involved, then only the devil That's right. is involved. Yeah. So that is the devil speaking. Anybody mm -hmm. who says Christians shouldn't help decide morality or laws in a nation, they're serving evil. Yeah. And so we have to be very clear what is good and what is evil and try to get the good well, into law. This is why, you know, the majority of the epistles really address... Uh, protections against apostasy and false doctrine. Mm -hmm. And doctrine to the church is the ballast of the ship. It may not propel it, it may not direct it, but it keeps it stable. Mm -hmm. And the doctrine has been perverted in the pulpits. They've, we've abdicated sound doctrine and have replaced it. And this is why then the church abdicates its place in education, in politics, because there's no stomach for it, because they, they don't believe what, we, what the Bible actually teaches in sound doctrine. That's right. And um, in fact, we see this kind of um, revolution happening where the doctrine, you know, Christians, our society was kind of united on a lot of stuff. There were some things we differ, differed about at the edges. In fact, we were sort of somewhat opening the tents. Uh, you know, we, we started recognizing the importance of the Old Testament, of the Jewish culture and, and our Jew, Jewish heritage. And, um, and we became more tolerant of those folks who, who didn't believe in God. And because we found out we, ha we had to find a better way to bring them to God. Mm -hmm. So our country was growing and maturing. But like I said, like in the last 15 years, um, a new evil has crept into America. And you can see that's clearly not from God, mm -hmm. and, and it is serving evil. Uh, the radical change in sexual behavior, definitions, redefinitions of the family, and now we're seeing this into law, this radical indoctrination programs happening, mm -hmm. where educators and teachers who are supposed to be teaching virtue and hard work and, and the values that formed our country made us a great republic have now been completely being burned down, mm -hmm. literally as we speak. So. Uh, Christians have to be involved again, speak the truth again, and now we have to literally retake these institutions. The human service programs, the homeless programs, the drug programs, we see how now they're serving evil, mm -hmm. and especially education, from child care to the higher ed yeah. programs. Because now we see the other side has taken them over, and their ideology is being pumped out, is teaching our kids. And um, I don't know if you uh, saw the statistic from, I think it was the uh, uh, Arizona State University. It said that right now, millennials, 18 to 24, up to 39% of them do not identify as heterosexual anymore. Mm -hmm. They're LGBTQ. A civilization, a society cannot survive if literally almost half the children are gay mm -hmm. or, or adopt this radical gender and sexual ideology. Well, this, this is the problem with the CRT approach because 
ultimately, I don't see that it's about race or ethnicity, whatever term somebody wants to use to d describe skin color, not culture. It's really about the LGBTQ plus agenda. And, and in order to push that forward, we have to demonize Judeo-Christian values. We have to demonize the patriarchal structure of men being the head of the home. We have to demonize Christian values so that they can push forward their agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're ad addressing it at the school level, because they know within a generation or two, they can do it no problem. Mm -hmm. So how are you yeah. seeing that today? Yes, and one of the ways they're demonizing it is they are saying that the Judeo-Christian ethos is oppressive. And they say it's oppressive because it's dominant. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that we need to come to grips with here, is that the Judeo-Christian worldview absolutely has been dominant in yes. this country since almost the beginning. And that hasn't been a bad thing, no. okay? But they're painting it as a bad thing because they equate dominance with oppression. Yes. It, the whole thing is demonic, you know, mm -hmm. the bottom line here. And until it, it, they're it, dominant. It, until they're dominant. <laughs> and, and that's what's happening right now. I mean, you talk about cancel culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not going to tolerate Christianity if they get their way. Right. Okay, th they are out to cancel Christianity. You, mm -hmm. you know, it was at one point, you know, they will just stay in the church and you'll be fine. I think they're going beyond that. Their intention yeah. is, it, it's, is much more nefarious than that. Yes. I, let me just th quote here uh, something from... Um, Alexis de Tocqueville. Bear with me here a little bit. This is pretty mind-blowing here. Alexis de Tocqueville was a French historian of note. He still is a French, uh, former French historian of note. He came here in the 1830s to find out what made this country tick. He said this, quote, from the earliest settlement of the immigrants, politics and religion contracted an alliance which has never been dissolved. This is what he said in 1830. I do not know whether all the Americans have a sincere faith in their religion, for who can search the human heart, but I am certain that they hold it to be indispensable to the maintenance of Republican institutions. He's not talking about the Republican Party, but the Republic. This opinion, he said, is not peculiar to a class or of citizens or to a party. It belongs to the whole nation and to every rank of society. Imagine that. The Americans combine the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. Upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my, imagine that, the yeah. first thing that hits him is this. The longer I stayed there, the more I did perceive the great political consequences resulting from this state of things, to which I was unaccustomed. In France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom pursuing courses diametrically opposed to one another. But in America, I found that they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. America is still the place where the Christian religion has kept the greatest real power over men's souls, and nothing better demonstrates how useful and natural it is to man, since the country where it now has the widest sway is both the most enlightened and the freest. That was America in 1830. Yeah. Didn't mean that everybody was a Christian, no. but that there was a common consensus here that the Christian ethos, the Christian way of thinking, the Christian way of doing things mm -hmm. was what this country was all about. That's gone. Yeah. It is absolutely gone. Uh, and that's what we're concerned about here. And, uh, and, and the question is, how do we, what do we do about restoring that? Yeah. You pass laws to ban critical race theory, this radical sexual and gender and Marxist ideology, and we have to reorient our society but to do that, we need leaders and pastors speaking up, mm -hmm. recognize that we have to bring people back to Christ again. Why are so few pastors addressing the current issues that are right on in front of us, that are life and death issues? They really are for the future of our country. Why are so few pastors speaking up? I'd love to understand why uh, Pastor Dennis here is so unique uh, in his uh, vocal uh, yeah, proclamations of the gospel. But that is unique. Um, I think most pastors or, 
or like um, politicians. They're, uh, they're worried about public opinion. Uh, they're worried about being liked by the culture. They get distracted by money, money needs, you yep. know. Uh, paying the uh, mortgage. Weekly, paying the mortgage. Mm-hmm. Just all the human stuff. Um, I, I believe politicians and pastors have to go into this be, being prepared to be persecuted, being mm-hmm. prepared to not be liked mm-hmm. by the uh, worldly wisdom of, of the culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, the parable of the sower of the seed uh, talks about these sort of issues that could distract you from really proclaiming the truth of the gospel, truth of Jesus Christ. But it, it, it is tough, especially now it seems like we have the whole, uh, all the institutions against us, media, academia, uh, the Democratic Party, uh, these radical liberals now control everything. So it is a daunting um, uh, a group of folks that, that are opposing us right now. But we have the truth on our side, I think. Well, <clears throat> most pastors have attended theological seminaries that are owned by the left. So they've uh, been indoctrinated by a uh, perverted view of the world, not a, not a true worldview. Um, I do work in Muslim countries, and I do work in the birthplace of Hinduism and Buddhism. Hmm. Okay, so we got the trifecta of three of the largest cult religions in the world. And I've never seen more intolerant religions than those. Hmm. Islam, Hindu, and Buddhism. Okay. Tibet, you name it. You, they are locked down from having any thought. And if you want to talk about systemic racism, you will find it under those regimes. Mm-hmm. Okay? And so most pastors have never traveled. They have zero experience of what the real world is like. And so they listen to CNN, they listen to other sound bites, and this is where they're getting their theology. Mm. They don't get it from the Word, and they don't get it from experiential um, connections of real, authentic transactions that are happening in the world. And so then they live in this false bubble, and many of them are hired, and if you can be hired, you can be fired. Mm -hmm. See, the reason I can do what I'm doing now is because I prepared for this moment Decades ago. I've been here 30 years. You don't look that old. I'm I'm 12. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I've prepared for this over the last, I would say, specifically 17 years. Um, We make sure that the people that are part of our core team and that that serve, that they hold to these values. Biblical marriage between one man and one woman. Mm -hmm. Biblical gender and sexuality, two Mm -hmm. genders. And biblical sexuality, the sex is reserved between one man and one woman Mm -hmm. in the bonds of marriage. We believe in the rule of law we, uh, with responsible policing. We believe in the right to life. Mm-hmm. And we believe that we're all created equal in the eyes of God. We've come from one blood, as Acts tells mm-hmm. us. Well, guess what? If you have a, a, a pool of believers that hold to those things, you can, you can go anywhere. You, you can go bear hunting with a stick. It seems like that those are basic things. I mean, they used to be. They're the most controversial things now, though, that you will find in... Christian schools yeah. and churches. Sad. And, wow. And we don't want to talk about those things. Or, well, th- behind closed doors, they will agree with you that those things are important, but publicly from the pulpit, they won't declare them. So they're afraid of something. Mm-hmm. They are afraid maybe of having a church split. Yes. And uh, so they got to uh, give up the building and mm-hmm. everything else. Is that the main driver? Or yeah, are they they're afraid somebody's going to pick it They're 50 their... or 60 years old and they're going to get fired. Uh, I, I know of a pastor in the Midwest. He preached on uh, the Right to Life Sunday. He preached against abortion and for life for the first time ever. And on Monday, the board called him in and fired him. Wow. Um, th- there, is, there is a massive trend, especially up here. Woke is, is very popular in a lot of churches. Yeah, but what pastor in there really would want to be a pastor of a church with a board like that that's going to fire them if they speak the truth? I mean, maybe they ought to be fired and go somewhere where they can do what, what you're doing. Wouldn't that be better? Well, what I think and what they think <laughs> pro- <laughs> probably <laughs> different. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but my thing is, is where's the life? I, I have to be, a, a, I'm entrusted with the doctrine of the word. I'm entrusted with that. I, I don't have to defend it. I don't have to change it but I'm a caretaker of it. And it's not my doctrine. It's God's doctrine. And I've surrendered to that. 
And I think that's that's the piece. People have to surrender to the truth. And this is why CRT is so uh, such a powerful tool because it's so controversial. I mean, most pastors won't even usher uh, uh, utter the word BLM Inc. in their church uh, mm. unless it's to raise a fist in solidarity um, mm. rather than understanding that Black Lives Matter, but Black Lives Matter Inc. has nothing to do with black lives. Mm. It goes back to CRT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Marxism and this radical um, sexual and gender uh, agenda. Yep. So as an educator, and I would say an a, authority in your field, what are you communicating to teachers and, and educators today concerning this? About critical race theory? Yeah. Urban. Well, actually, that's a great segue. Next Tuesday evening, I'm doing a live Zoom webinar through Mark's organization yes. on critical race theory. We're going to talk about where it came from. We're talking about the, the guts of it. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, where it's headed and why it's headed there. Yeah. And um, it, it, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's scary stuff. Uh, humanly speaking, we have to, you know, bit, put our big boy pants on here and look it square in the face, say, the activists that are involved, they do not want an equal voice among many voices. That is not what they're after. No. They're after cancel the Christian ethos. Yes. You know, I don't know if you've ever read Dark Agenda, uh, the book. Uh, who was it that wrote that? I can't remember his name right now. Um, David Horowitz, who's, an eth who's a Jew. You know, He says, mm -hmm. hey, Christians, you better wake up because there's an agenda here. And, and it's, not, it, it's not friendly. And it's not polite, and, and you, you are in for a, a rude awakening if you don't understand what's going on here. They want to cancel Christianity. Yeah. So we need to wake up to the fact that the stakes are pretty big here. And um, now not all of the people teaching critical race theory in our schools and reading Heather Has Two Mommies are Marxists. They don't, mo most of them don't even know where it came from. Mm -hmm. you know, they haven't really thought long enough to figure that out, or nobody's told them. But that's the basic thing it's built on, the oppressor versus the oppressed. Mm -hmm. And every time there's an oppressor and they define that, it has to be canceled. And that's the only way through this thing. And uh, so we are in the receiving end of, of something very serious here. And so I am trying a little bit here to wake up people who will listen to me mm -hmm. to say, well, here's what we're dealing with here. I'm not trying to be an alarmist, but I'd like to be an alarmist. Because if we're not, uh, people will not see what's going on, and they will be continue to be duped and, and just fall asleep here to say, oh, everything's fine, it'll never happen here. Right. It can happen here. Well, and I'm finding that in other states, I mean, obviously Washington is very unique. You know, a lot of people think New York, Washington, Oregon, and California are the, is the mecca of liberalism. But I really, I really think there's something in a demonic way special about Washington state as being the test bed hmm. of what's going to be rolled out elsewhere. And I don't think other states and other churches in other states realize the fight that we're in up here mm -hmm. and they need to be a part of this fight. And so, yep. And, and, and I would say that, that uh, the majority of the examples that I'm going to use on Tuesday night, and I'm going to actually quote them. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show video clips of them. The majority of my examples are from Washington state. Yeah, almost all of them, and they're very close to home. So yeah, we are in the thick of it here. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you so much for uh, joining with us today, and uh, we're going to jump into another segment. So stay tuned. Come back to us. Uh, don't forget to follow us on uh, iTunes, Spotify, you name it. All all of those different media outlets but we so appreciate you being a part and just listening says that you don't want to remain ignorant you want to be empowered with tools so thank you gentlemen for being on and god bless you and we'll see you in our next segment